Thank you, folks. So let's open the um, board meeting. Um, at, do, we have to, do we have to do like a attendance roll or anything since we're remote? Yeah. All right. Um, so opening the board meeting at uh, 6.33 p.m. Um, on April 1st. Uh, welcome everyone, this is Jim Murphy, board chair, and let's just go around and the only people that have to announce their presence are the board members. You wanna call them out, Jim, so they don't all talk over each other? Yeah, um, Jerry Huck. Present, not present, on mute. I saw you. Can't hear you, Jerry. Okay, let's go back to Jerry. Ryan, good job. <laughs> Ryan was having a problem with his audio earlier, so he's calling in right now. Okay, uh, Andrew Stein. Here. Uh, Mara Iverson. Here. Um, I see Ryan now. Do, do you have audio or no? No, why don't you give a thumbs up? Um, Bridget AC. Yep, here. Uh, Anakit. Here. Jill? Here. Did I miss anyone? Um, Ryan's there, but um, on mute. Um, but he's trying to call in. Um, so first item of business, uh, public comment and do we have members of the public on? Anna's gonna help us with that. So Anna, can you kind of guide this part? Sure, I um, don't see many members um, of the public in the participants list, but if there are any members, I'd suggest they unmute themselves. Um, yeah, if you wanna speak up, just... Um, I don't know if we have a... Do you have a joint chat function? That might be a way for people to queue up, but it seems like not an issue. We do have a chat function and there's no activity in it. Okay. Um, so let's move on to uh, consent agenda. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? And I think you have to definitely announce yourself when you, by name, uh, when you make the motion. So everyone knows who's talking. This is Jerry Huck. I move to accept the consent agenda. Do I have a second? This is Jill Remick, I second. Okay. All those in favor, and do we have to do a roll call or? Roll call, yeah. Okay. Um, Ryan? In favor, aye. Anakit? Aye. Bridget? Aye. Jill? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Mara? Aye. And Andrew? Aye. Did I miss anyone? I don't think so. Um, <laughs> And since that was everybody no days, um, on to uh, board discussion COVID-19. Libby, you wanna take it away? Yeah, so you have in your packet the testimony that I gave last Friday at the legislature. Um, I'm gonna run through some highlights and what's changed since March 27th, cause you know, changes a lot right now. Um, I would encourage the board to jump in when you have any questions, so it can be a true discussion. Um, I will just say as, uh, as leadership team meeting, we've been using the chat feature and kind of stopping and using the chat and then answering questions there, and I have that up, so if people want to do that, or if you just want to kind of raise your hand, <laughs> but I can't see everybody right now, so I think the chat, if you want to chat in, then let, a, let us know. Um, so... 
just the absolute highlights. Um, I think the network of superintendents and the Vermont Superintendents Association led by Jeff, Fr Jeff Francis and assisted by Chelsea Myers and Christy Tate have been absolutely marvelous um, together. And, and that should just be publicly stated that they, the Vermont Superintendents Association has worked tirelessly for the kids and educators across Vermont. Um, and I'd just like to celebrate that. I'd also like to celebrate our, our, our faculty um, I've said it before in board meetings to our board, and I will say it again that our faculty has been absolutely amazing. And I think we have a we have a great we have a a great platform to launch off of when we get back to whatever normalcy is going to be um, in the future. And I'm just so proud of the work that all of our faculty has uh, put forth. Um, and we also just so you know have every administrator on the line here. So if uh, people have specific questions around different parts of this plan, then by all means, our administrators will speak up to it as well. Um, in regards to learning, we're moving into the continuity of learning plan. I will say this over and over again, that um, school going forward through the end of the year will in no way uh, replace or be like school in a right, as, as typically happens um, in-person instruction cannot be replaced by remote learning. And so we need to have, um, we need to have that expectation going forward. Our leadership team, along with teacher lead leaders from our teachers union and teachers from the field and our coaches have been working on a plan for continuity of learning. We haven't gotten to the final piece yet, um, but we're working on it. We have task force out working on pieces of it. We have a lot of it put together already. Um, we are not expecting students, nor are we wanting students to be in front of a computer for six and a half hours a day to make up a full school day. That's not the expectation um, going forward. And we're, we're working really hard to think what is the best reality for not only our families, but also our teachers to maintain and do well. We're having a lot of really good, hard conversations about that right now. And we're also talking to districts across the state to see what other people are doing. So um, we're not reinventing the wheel by ourselves. We are all in this together. Um, it will look different across the different grade levels. So our K to four will look much different than our seven to, or, or I'm sorry, our five to eight, and that will look different than our nine to 12. And it almost has to be, they're, they're very different species, those grade levels. So um, we need to be thinking about that. Some of the things that are our priority is our children's relationships with us and with their families, as well as their mental health, has to be the first priority. Um, we want to ensure that kids, or ensure the best we can be, encourage kids to be outside and playing with socially isolating behaviors, of course. Um, but it's so important to not lose these pieces of just physical and mental health. And so we want our teachers to be encouraging kids to do that. Um, and I'm, I'm worried a lot about our younger kids because so much of their learning is social and play-based and we can't replicate that in the environment that we're in right now. So I'm concerned about that piece. Um, but, and, but, knowing, but saying I'm concerned about it and also knowing that we have to keep this situation in perspective and that this is a blip in our lives, in the long-term timeline of our lives and that we will get through this. Um, and it's not gonna be horrendous for the rest of our lives for the most part. So we need to, we need to really put it in perspective as well. Um, so I have a question from, so I'll, I'll, I'll end it there with learning. Uh, oh, the other thing I wanted to talk about with learning, we're talking a lot right now about um, two very big pieces that influence equity, because we want to try to create a process that is as equitable as possible. And there's a long progression about what equity means. Um, and we're taking all of that into consideration. The two pieces that, that uh, we have been asked to really attune to are like a grading piece and an attendance piece. And those are two pieces that our leadership team are grappling with right now about what that looks like. And um, the AOE actually is making a broad understanding of what attendance is. Um, and we, we, get, we have to define how that looks. And we also have to define how kids are showing their learning. They're calling it grading. I'm calling it feedback. So 
we have a we have to have an understanding of what that means. After the um, initial maintenance of learning period is over, April 13th, we will be moving into continuity of learning and there is an expectation that kids will be taking part in this. Um, and we have heard rumor that some of our older kids are, are thinking that they don't have to take part in this, um, that it's an option. And after April 13th, that is no longer the case. Um, so we'll be, we'll be looking at how do we truly re-engage kids um, between now and then. So that's a, that's a big concern of us. So Bridget has a question here. Thank you for the call out for the VSA. What kind of guidance and support is the Agency of Education providing? Are there needs the AOE could be meeting that boards and VSBA should be asking for? Um, the AOE, like the rest of us, is doing the best they can with what their resources are. Um, I think that we are all working under a very pressurized system and uh, tensions are a little high <laughs> and um, we're, we're working hard. We're, we just had, um, with the continuity of learning plan, there was some back and forth between the superintendents and the, and the secretary and deputy secretary and um, another AOE official. And that, that back and forth prov proved to be really good in the end and, and came out with a, with a really good expectation and plan for what the continuity of learning plan could be and should be. And so that was a really, um, it was a nice effort at collaboration and I hope to see more of that collaborative effort going forward um, from here on out. The AOE has a lot of things that they're balancing right now um, and trying to keep up with the field and the constantly shifting environment is proving difficult for all of us. So I, that's where I would land that. Um, and, and all of us in different, our different roles, whether we're director of curriculum or we're special ed directors or superintendents, um, are meeting with the various aspects of the AOE, um, and hoping that they are talking to each other, like our district employees are talking to each other. Uh, so Jill is asking, can you talk a bit more about attendance and wondering about the, the at-risk students, are they being accounted each, for each day? This is like, we're, we're really, we're talking a lot about how we define this um, and we've gotten some leeway. So one of the things that um, we know about attendance is that the attendance cannot be waived easily by the AOE because it's written in education law at the state level. And so it would have to be in order to change the attendance requirement, which personally I feel is the biggest equity issue in this, um, for us anyway, we, we don't have some of the other struggles that other districts do, but attendance is a huge equity issue. And the legislature would have to waive that attendance law in order for it to be different. Um, and thus far, they haven't done that. It's my understanding the VSA was going to talk to them about that. I'm not sure if that's happened or not. Um, we're, we're trying to define it very broadly. So um, we're still working that out right now, but we're, we're trying to define that for us and what works best for kids and families and teachers and what's doable. It's gonna look different than it does in a normal school day. It's not gonna be the same and the expectations aren't gonna be the same, but there is the expectation that kids will be attending to the learning opportunities that are given to them by school employees. Um, should we be starting a conversation about continuing learning over the summer, particularly with students with greater needs? We as superintendents have thrown that ball around a little bit, um, and that is an unknown at the moment, but it is certainly a conversation that is on our plates. Um, it could be something that we might want to think about. It would involve more financial resources um, because it's not currently written in, we don't do summer school right now at MRPS in this, in this way. So, um, so we'd have to really think and plan about what that would look like. Uh, Jim asks, is SOC being given to resources or materials to allow parents to give students educational experiences outside? So Jim, do you mean from like the technology world or more of like packets and worksheets, like, I was thinking like packet and worksheets. I mean, yeah, kind of like take your kid to, you know, North Branch and, uh, you know, rocks they could identify or, you know, yeah. 
you know, kind of like looking for, for frogs or whatever. I mean, just like interactive opportunities and giving some parents guidance about, um, you know, how to do that in a way that's going to be learning as well as interactive. Yeah. Yeah, that's where our educators' heads are. We we have to we have to set some really clear guidelines. Um, what we've been talking about is really limiting in those priority standards for the end of the year. So it's like one, maybe two for a really core content, and then really spoke speaking to transferable skills more than content skills. So there's like this happy balance between the two. And when you're thinking about transferable skills, you're really thinking about what are the passion projects kids are doing or could be doing um, and opening that up more where the, the team who's working on this right now has that idea in their head. It's just how do we word it and how do we, how do we make those guidelines? That's kind of where we are. Um, but we very much know that this is not going to be school as usual. And we're, we're going to do some kind of prioritize standards proficiencies towards very little. And then we're all, then we're going to open it up to say, what's the rest of the kid's day? What could that look like? Um, that is very much oriented to student independent work um, in terms of passion projects, building, designing, uh, going out and starting a new hobby and talking about how that's going for you. You know, that those kind of things that are more of just life skill pieces um, so, so we're talking about how do we balance those two and maybe put more weight on one than the other, but how do we, how do we make that clear to everybody? So we're, we're in that place of just defining it right now. Um, Andrew, if spring co-curriculars are already budgeted for, could those resources, both the money and those positions potentially be used for summer programming to provide additional educational opportunities over the summer? I realize there's too much uncertainty right now to answer that question. There's a lot of uncertainty right now um, around that piece. And um, we uh, there's also pieces like you have to, if you do summer, if you offer summer um, opportunities, then you have to staff it, right? And so um, that's not contractual by any means. So we'd be, we'd, that's just not a conversation I've had with the union yet, nor have I had with any teachers, nor have I had with our cleaning schedules or um, principals. So there's just a lot of unknowns there. It's definitely on the burner far away, but we're just not there yet <laughs> in terms of making decisions about that. Yes, it would mean additional teacher salaries. If we were doing that, we'd be paying teachers per diem for the work. Um, we also have to pay attention to the fiscal year. By summer, using this year's money, we're talking has to be by June 30th, just to clarify. Yeah, so you'd be moving into next year's budget. Just, it just feels like there's an urgency there for students that if students were already not at grade level and they're losing this time and losing the summer as well, it just feels like a long time to go without mm -hmm. more traditional instruction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I'm not ruling it out. I, um, I'm just saying we haven't gotten to the point of we're not, we're still, while the quicksand is thickening for us, so we're finding a little bit more solid ground, it's still there. <laughs> um, and we're still trying to answer the immediate questions around what's the continuity of learning plan looking like. Um, just, just to clarify too, I didn't. I just wanted to float the idea. Yeah, there would be additional, potentially be additional teacher salaries. Way too much uncertainty to decide anything on this now. But if some things get canceled, well, we know a lot of things have been canceled for this spring already. And if we were able to potentially use some of those resources, if things clear up from a public health standpoint heading into the summer, um, if we would be able to use those resources to potentially provide some additional opportunities. That was just the general yep. question to think about. Yep. So the learning, to sum up the learning piece of where we are right now, we're working on it. We are, um, we have teachers involved, we have the principals involved and we're all, we're right now we're coming up with the language and the, and the wording for how we're gonna guide our families and teachers going forward around what the expectations are. Um, I can also say just from feedback, we have 
some parents who are telling us enough, stop, we don't have the capacity right now. And then we have other teachers saying, give us more, or we have other parents saying, give us more work, give us more work. It's not enough. Um, so we're clearly in a space right now that we're going to do the best we can. It's not going to be perfect for everybody. Um, but it, but we're, we're in that place where there's a whole line again, and people are falling anywhere on that line around expectations for their kids and work. Um, so, so that's where we are there with learning, um, food service. So, and Jim, jump in here, please. If you, I saw you're on the line. So jump in if you, if you can. So we believe we have the capacity right now with our relatively uh, fragile system to feed a hundred or to make 150 meals. Uh, when I gave this presentation to the legislature on Friday, we were around a hundred. We were just lower than a hundred. I believe the principals told me today that we were about 120 in terms of meals. Um, so that is picking up significantly. Um, we also had some supply issues this time around about our supply not coming through as ordered. Jim's not worried about that yet, but Jim is a very big optimist too. So, <laughs> so, so I'll, I'll worry for him around that. Um, our drop-off locations are seeming to go well. Um, our principals are incredibly busy right now and they're the ones who are in doing the food service. Um, during the day. So we started talking today about how can we relieve that pressure a little bit, but also keep our buildings and our staff who are working safe by not inviting tons of people in. Um, so we're, we're playing around with some different ideas there. Um, Jim, do you want to chime in on how food service is going from your perspective? Yes. Um, it's definitely been a bit of a challenge. It's been a lot of work, um, but it's going well. I think you know the the numbers have gone up. Like you said, I think we got to about 125 meals. You know, meal bags which we serve today, which each one has a breakfast and a lunch. Um, so in reality, there are 250 meals. Um, let's see. So we we heard from the nutrition folks at the AOE that we have received a, a waiver so that we're able to um, claim all of the meals that we're serving um, through the sc summer school food program. So that's helpful. So that's good to know that we're able to be get uh, reimbursed for all of these meals. Um, the thing about supply is a little bit of a, is definitely a concern. Um, the Food Directors Association is working on um, procuring some more sort of ready to eat foods that we can have um, sort of squirreled away uh, in case the shortages continue. Um, we also um, have been able to get a waiver from the AOE on the summer school food meal pattern so that if there are problems with supply, we can get a waiver on the meal pattern so that we can do uh, what we need to do. Um, let's see, the reaching out to other sites in town really seemed to make a difference in terms of the number of people that we were reaching. That was, I think, the thing that really boosted our meals um, was you know getting out to the center of town, getting closer to the people. Um, has been a real success, I think, for, for our program. Um, and yeah, I guess just little by little, we're, we're doing it. Um, and we'll see how it, how it grows uh, over time. Right now, we're like right up against what I feel like is our um, sort of top capacity of around 150. Uh, we're gonna make 144 meals tomorrow. We'll see how that goes. Um, but I think that the way we're setting it up and that we're getting better at it, it shouldn't be, um, shouldn't be unreasonable. So that's, that's where I'm at, I, I think. So um, two things is, is Jim's finishing up there. So that's Jim Birmingham, who's our food service manager. So I didn't introduce him first, I just called him Jim. <laughs> um, Jim has been, I'm going to embarrass him a little bit, amazingly fabulous in this process. He is the reason why we are able to make this work. Our principals and, and central office staff are, also, are helping, but we are his sous chefs and he's the master in the kitchen. So um, we, we most definitely would not be able to do this without Jim. So I applaud you, Jim Birmingham, as I hope that's been clear to you, but you've been amazing through this whole thing. Has not complained once and just does his job. He's, he's awesome. I appreciate that. Thank you very much.
Yeah. And Jim Murphy says that uh, I just heard from some that some members of the public are getting a message that the host has another meeting in progress and are not able to get in. So I'm sorry about that. Anna, I'm wondering if you could help with that from the wings. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but that's yeah. yeah. She says she's looking into it. So if anybody can fix it, Anna can. Um, okay, so that's food service. Um, uh, Libby, can I chime in here? This is Anna. Yeah, Jay. absolutely. Um, one of the things that you had uh, mentioned, um, or one of the concerns that you had posted, was um, the staff or um, one of the team members getting sick. Um, is is there any thought given to the mitigation process for that um, for that concern? And again, thanks uh, Jim and his team for doing a fantastic job. Appreciate it. Yeah. Do you when you say mitigation, Annika, do you mean um, the cleaning of the facility, or do you mean the delivery and making of the food? I guess one of the the concern that that I had read was you know we have no contingency for um, if. Uh, uh, I'm sorry to say this, but if Jim or one of his team members get sick or, you know, the delivery people, yeah. Or whatever, yeah. what do we do in that case? I, I can I could speak to that, that we have, we have considered that. And I think that that's part of the rationale for me taking the load as much as I have on my own is to be able to leave, um, you know, some of my other staff members sort of in reserve uh, to be able to come and fill the need um, if we need to. And we've even have, um, you know, a couple of other people lined up from outside of the organization who could step in um, if we really needed to. So um, we sort of have a system set up that would be easy to transfer. And we definitely have um, some idea of how we would transfer those responsibilities if I was unable to continue for a reason. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I, I do. We did talk briefly today at our leadership team meeting about how do we spell our, our admin who are incredibly busy right now as well with just keeping their teachers afloat. And so that's something that we're starting to think about um, in terms of helping Jim out in the kitchen and, and how do we do that safely. So that's on our minds right now as well. Um, okay, any other food service type questions? All right, uh, child care for essential workers. The um, in Directive Five from the governor, the the most recent one who addresses that addresses this piece. Um, so if you're looking it up, it's it's the Governor Scott's Directive Five continuation of learning. It's the actual title of it. Um, he further clarified um, who qualifies for essential workers. So uh, so now it's um, one or parents who are both essential workers. Or, um, or the child is unsafe in their home, um, qualify. And when he says essential workers, he's talking about frontline workers, people who are working on the front lines of the COVID epidemic, um, which still has some um, subjectivity to it, which puts me in a hard place as a superintendent having to judge who's on the front line and who's not. Currently, we are at um, we are pretty much at capacity with what we've set up. So we have paid um, some people to go into the homes to serve as a babysitter for about five or six families. That's working out well right now. Um, should we have more need uh, that qualifies under Directive 5? Um, we, that will, we definitely are at capacity and I'm not sure how we would handle that. Um, we do have some volunteers from the community. We have one family who's already kind of adopted a kid. Um, and thankfully there, I heard from the parents last week and said it was working out well. So I hope it still is. I haven't checked in lately. I should probably do that tomorrow. Um, and I believe we have a couple more volunteers waiting in the wings. Um, should we need it? Bottom line is parents understandably do not want their kids leaving their house. Um, and so the babysitting aspect does work for them. Um, we just don't have a lot of people who are in the space to volunteer to do that. Uh, and they're not volunteer, they're being paid to do that. But, but even with the payment, it's hard to find people who are willing. And that's understandable as well. I don't say that with any judgment behind it. Um, so the, the childcare ask was by far the biggest ask of schools. 
um, and has been the uh, most difficult for, for districts and superintendents to manage. Um, only a handful of districts across the state opened up a school site. Berlin did um, and our neighboring district in Barrie did. Both superintendents are considering closing those sites right now because the attendance is so low and the need for staff is so high. Uh, the CDC put out guidelines as to how, if you were running a center, how that needed to be run that are nearly impossible if you've ever met a child. Uh, so schools didn't even think to really open. If they thought about it, they quickly closed that, that lid. Um, Burlington has set up a program very much like ours. Uh, and But some people are not willing to take the risk to do a program like ours. So, uh, what, so Andrew asked, uh, what is the demand in terms of total number of students for child care at MRPS? It's hard to answer that because a lot, um, probably about 15 to probably about 20 families filled out the Let's Grow Kids survey, which is the statewide survey that I get results from every day. When I call those families, some of them had already figured out child care. Um, some of them realized that our capacity issues were, were pretty tight and said, I'll figure this out in a different way. Um, currently, we're servicing six families who are in need, um, and it's working out pretty well. Um, do you know if child care providers without health care are covered by any of the recent federal actions if they get sick providing care? I'm not positive on that. I did bring that um, personally to the House Education Committee last Friday, so I'm, I'm, I'm not positive there's actions that have been taken around that. However, I believe talking to our partners at Turtle Island, Mickey Sunny, who I've been in close contact with, we've been working closely on this, um, she believes that they were going, she, she felt that they were going to get that. Turtle Island was going to open up a center. I'm not sure if they are anymore. I think because they were hearing from families also that they would rather have people in the homes, in their own homes. Um, and so I'm not sure where they are at that moment, if, uh, at that moment, if they're going to open up or not. Um, Orchard Valley is another provider in Montpelier who was opening up just for kids of families from Orchard Valley. And I'm, I'm actually not sure where they have been. I haven't spoken to them in a while. Um, so childcare for right now has been taken care of. The system is incredibly precarious and fragile um, and could break down overnight. Um, but I will, if, if parents need it, if they're on the front line and there's no safe place for their kid to go, then we'll, I'll figure it out for them. Um, but that's kind of where we are right now. It's just the determination of, of me figuring it out. <laughs> we'll find something to work. I'll, I'll call Jill Remick because she's one of our volunteers who's willing to adopt a child. <laughs> um, so that's what Jen said about Jill. Uh, Still so true. <laughs> okay, good. So that's where we are with uh, child care for the moment. Do we have any questions on child care? All right. Um, and so the other just stretcher, stressors, um, I know Andrew's got this stress as, as well, um, and Grant's been speaking to it um, also behind the scenes. The future um, budget projections, projections and economic fallout are, are just starting to be predicted. Um, there's a whole lot of unknown happening with economic fallout from this pandemic. There will be some, um, so we're, we're kind of guessing right now what that's going to be. Grant has a pretty good sense for the next two years. Um, Grant, would you like to speak to that, please? Sure. Um, we're kind of in a weird place because we know the economy is really going to get wrecked, but, um, but we already have a budget this year. And if anything, our expenses probably will be coming in low. So the only problem we would have is on the revenue side. For example, we won't have as much revenue for food service probably. Um, but I think if I'm looking at it right now, FY20, I'm not really concerned with unless something really strange happens in the coming weeks, like we're told that certain special ed costs are not eligible and we reduce, we get a reduced special ed revenue line or, um, 
you know, if, uh, if the state determines that we should all be seeing lower expenses, so they reduce our last ed funding or ed spend ed spending grant amount, which comes in at the end of April. Um, or uh, I think cash flow wise, a concern could be if the municipalities have a problem collecting revenues because their last tax revenue um, collection is in May for both Montpelier and Roxbury. So if they have a problem collecting tax revenues and sending it to us, I think eventually we'll get that, but it's more of a cash flow kind of concern. And you know, if it doesn't happen by June 30th, it could be just a, a little bit of a nightmare. But for FY20, I'm, right now, I'm not pushing a panic button. FY21, kind of similarly, um, you know, we have an approved budget and it's been a voter approved budget. And um, so we know what our expenses can be based on the budget and our revenues should ma match what our expenses are. The challenge is that because the economy is facing such a struggle, the uh, state might end up dropping the dollar yield, which would mean tax rates go up significantly. So we could have an issue where the voters approved a budget with an estimated tax rate, which was our best guess at the time. And based on this whole situation that's happening, that tax rate estimate could be dramatically wrong. I mean, it could be higher. Now, that being said, that's not great for taxpayers, and we could end up with some people that are not very happy. But our FY21 revenue and expense budget is set. So I'm not really concerned about just financially managing FY21. To me, the biggest concern is FY22 and building a budget in the fall. Because if we have high tax rates, we could have the public that's not very happy with tax rates. You know, we may not have um, a community that's as as open and giving as they have historically been, and we may have to make some tough decisions when we build the FY22 budget. But there's a lot that could change, but that's just my perspective for now. Hey, Grant, this is Jim. Um, I've just read in kind of my glance of the, uh, you know, cascading kind of catastrophe of news over the last few weeks that, uh, as a result of this, healthcare costs could potentially spike pretty significantly in the next couple of years. Is that a consideration or a factor that we're giving thought to at all? Uh, once again, it, it is, but um, not an immediate one because our health rates have been set, our premium rates have been set for FY21. Okay. So I think what could happen is because of high health expenses, we could see health rates go up dramatically for FY22. So it all to me is kind of pushing this bow wave of concerns to 22. Um, the, the problem with, you know, taxpayers being able to afford and healthcare costs potentially going up dramatically. So there's a lot of concerns there. They're just not immediate concerns yet, as far as anything I've heard. And Jill mentioned something in the chat about um, funding in the stimulus bill. That's, that's a great question. Right now, I'm not sure what that's gonna be. I mean, we're being told that we can track specific expenses that are related to COVID-19 and perhaps get reimbursed for those. To be honest, we're not seeing a lot of that. Some of the childcare expenses, like Libby mentioned, but a lot of our expenses are just routine expenses keeping people paid that we would have had regardless of the COVID-19. The thing that we're gonna have is potentially childcare expenses and loss of revenue for food service, which could mean a higher deficit to cover. Um, so I'm not sure whether that, that stimulus money is gonna help us dramatically locally, but my hope is that it might help the state so that they are in a better position from an, a statewide ed fund uh, perspective. I think that's exactly right, Grant. All right, any other, um, any mo other money comments or questions, uh, particularly for Grant? So I just want to say my I have a fear um, as a school board member 
that the legislature is going to be in a really, really difficult situation with all of this and that they can make some decisions without communicating with us and the school board association and the superintendents association because they have to make a lot of really difficult decisions really quickly that could have a major impact on our school's finances and community's finances as they pertain to schools. And that's like the big X factor when I'm looking at all of this. It's like, yeah, you know, things could get pushed off until FY22 unless the state is in a really difficult position and the Ed Fund's in a really difficult position, which we know that's going to be the case for all of these things. And what might they try to do? And I don't know, Libby, maybe you could speak to this. Grant, maybe you could speak to this. I don't know the extent to which these these different associations are engaging the legislature on these issues right now. I can tell you that the, the VSA and the VSBA are very closely engaging the legislature on a number of things. However, there are so many unknowns right now because everybody's just reacting to the crisis in the moment that um, these are all predictions uh, in a vast unknown territory. Because right now the legislature is talking about passing like a three month budget for next fiscal year and then being in session in the fall. So this, you know, they're clearly, what, I, what I'm hearing from over there is they're prepared to do anything and everything to adjust for this. And so we might end up being just fine, especially if we get federal dollars. And, but that's the big, I feel like that's the big X factor if they adjust the laws while we're in the middle of a fiscal year or something of that nature. Tomorrow at two, from two to four, the two committees, um, House Ways and Means and House Education are having a joint hearing. And it looks like, I just checked their, their um, testimony list and it does look like the VSBA is on there plus a few um, school districts. So I think, um, I think, yeah, I think they are starting to have that conversation and inviting the right people to the table. Um, Cause I do think Grant hit the nail on the head. I think what they're, they're going to try to do based on the conversations I had today, because I'm, I'm the property tax director. So that means that I have to talk a lot about people who are in municipalities who are struggling to figure out how they're going to pay their portion of the ed fund. If people aren't paying their property tax bills. So I've been following it a little bit closer than, um, than normal, but it, 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 uh, I, my sense from that brief amount of time I was um, listening in today is that, if there is, depending on how they can use that revenue, and I haven't opened up the link you just sent, Andrew, is that they would try to use it to try to cushion the, the blow to the statewide ed fund and try to keep the tax rates and the yield reasonable. Um, I'm not sure if it also includes a piece that would go to each individual school or not, or district or not, but, but yeah, I think that's definitely one of the main goals of the legislature is to try to fill the whole ed fund so that it keeps tax rates stabilized. Grant, you're muted. I believe the AOE is um, invited to those testimonies too. I think probably Brad James. I, I traded some emails with Brad James today to give him kind of my perspective on the concerns that I'm seeing for this year, next year, and the following year. So I passed my concerns on and said, you know, the, the big thing is if the AOE decides to play hardball and say that some of our special ed costs are not allowable and they reduce our revenues, that's going to cause a huge problem. You know, if, as Andrew said, the state decides to do something funky, like have a clawback like they did a few years ago with health plan changes, like, oh, you're going to have lower expenses so you can deal with less money and they pulled some money back, that could be a problem. Um, but I'll be in, I'll be very anxious to see what they have to say. But as of right now, I, I'm just I'm refusing to panic right now. Well, and, and the, definitely don't panic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I think I think the legislators and the governor. I mean, everyone understands that if you give schools less revenue, the only way to deal with that is to lay off people, which is not what anyone wants to have happen. And that just shifts cost to the unemployment fund. I mean. It, I think everyone understands that that's not the answer to an economic or a public health crisis. So I'm going to try not to panic too. Yeah. And I, I also hope there's an understanding that as we, you know, come out of the recovery, you know, Vermont's going to want to be in a strong position and, and strong schools are, are part of, uh, you know, 
it's a strong fabric of society and a, you know, I think being in a position for a strong recovery. So, um, well, I think we should expect that there might be some, some tightening, hopefully it won't be dramatic or, um, ill thought out. Yeah. Okay. Um, other stressors just, I continually work on and worry about and have my mind toward our teacher and staff morale. Um, they've had a lot of demands placed on them and I'm working very closely with our teachers union in order to provide clarity to our staff. I have a meeting with them tomorrow morning. Um, and so that's something that's constantly on my mind, our, our teachers and staff, um, as well as our administrators who are here with us tonight are all um, truly amazing human beings. And I'm so proud and privileged to be a part of their group. Um, so they've done fantastically so far. I just want to keep them going because the, as I've been saying, the initial adrenaline rush of this is fading. Um, and so now we really need to move into very purposeful planning to, to create a plan that is doable for everybody, um, or at least most of us. <laughs> um, so that's, that's kind of where we are right now. Um, I do, I have no idea because I'm not a public health expert as to what the scope of this is going to be in terms of how many people in our communities are, are going to get sick. Um, and what's our plan B then? Um, so don't know if a teacher gets sick or has a family member get sick, then you can't exactly just get a substitute to do this work. Um, it's too different. So uh, how do we how do we pick each other up? Like how, how do colleagues pick each other up? And that's a that's a big and different ask. Um, so there's some things. Sorry, my family's in the background. <laughs> there's some things that uh, that um, we don't have an answer for just yet. Um, and I also wonder what the plan B is from our state government. Uh, we are not the only people who are saying that our food service and our child care service is precarious. And so I wonder from our state government, what is the plan B when schools can no longer do this? Um, and we haven't heard an answer about that just yet. Um, and what's their plan C, quite honestly, after that? Um, and then as always, I'm always concerned with pro providing services to kids with special needs or English language learners, making sure that mental health challenges are taken care of. I've said that to the board before. Um, so we're working on working out, working out systems with parents collaboratively for, for those types of learners. Um, so that's where, that was my presentation of the legislature. Some things have changed, some things haven't changed. Um, but right now our priority as a district is really naming what that continuation of learning is going to look like. Um, it's not going to be perfect the first go around and we know that and we will continue. It's going to be an iterative process and we will continue to look at feedback from our families and our students and our teachers to see how we need to um, revise as we go uh, moving forward. So I'm happy or my and the principals and administrators here are happy to take any questions? We also have Andrew Garosa here. I saw if you have any buildings and grounds questions, I'm sure he'd be happy to um, answer some too. Uh, Libby Staff Morrell, do you have any other suggestions on how board members and community members can help? I'm sending positive feedback to my kiddos teacher and principal, and I know Montpelier teachers are doing a parade on Friday. They are. We want to see the Montpelier teachers. They are, they are um, doing a parade on Friday, and we want to state that we do not want any congregation of mass people um, stay in your homes or stay in your yards. Please do not congregate. And um, because there is a stay safe, stay home order and we want everybody to stay safe uh, for that. Um, but if we can make a kid smile by driving past their house, we'll also do that. Um, and as far as help, um, board member and community members help. Adrian Gill with the MRPS Pi um, organization and I have been in close communication throughout this whole thing. Um, and I know, I know Adrian and others um, are very eager, eager to help and she's been an absolute asset to us in the district, me, just <laughs> and, and absolutely Adrian, I, I appreciate that. Um, and I, and we're, we're keeping them 
we're keeping them in our back pocket. So when our systems and board members, quite honestly, you're in our back pockets for when our systems um, can't handle it, then people who really know the schools well could potentially step in. Um, but right now we think we're okay. That could change very quickly. Um, and I know that there's members in our community and members on this board who would step in in a heartbeat to help us out. And that is that is uh, very heartening to know as well. So I'm happy to field any other questions and I'm sure the team is happy to field any other questions. If there is any, if not, we can move on there. Jen Murphy. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say, and I, I think everybody on the board feels this way. Um, thank you so much for everything you've done through this process. I feel like we can't reiterate that enough. You, you and the administration and all the faculty and the custodial staff, the food workers, everybody has really risen to the occasion. And um, I think uh, this community already valued our schools and those who work in them and they value them more now than ever. So. Yeah, this was a team effort. This is our team is phenomenal. Yeah, no, I want to reiterate all that as well too. Um, it's, it's really been uh, a heartening thing to watch and uh, your, your leadership is thrown through Libby, shown through Libby, your team's leadership is thrown, shown through. I think the dedication of our teachers has shown through. Um, I know this is really tough and, uh, well, well out of the job description. So <laughs> yeah, right. it's other duties as assigned. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We we are we're very appreciative and I, I think the community is very appreciative um, as well. Thank you. Um so anything else for Libby before we move on? Are we gonna have a Roxbury gazebo update from Andrew? Yep. I think so. Andrew, you ready for that? Andrew? Yeah, let me find yeah, him. Um, oh, he might not be on anymore. Where, where'd he go? I can, I can see, see him. Around and he's connecting to audio now. So oh, is he? OK. <laughs> oh, there he is. Hi, Andrew. You're still connecting. Keeping us hanging. <laughs> Slow connections. Grant, while we're waiting for Andrew's, Andrew's thing to connect, do you want to start? Do you, did you say you had stuff? I have it too. I just have to find it. Oh, wait, there's Andrew. Nope, maybe not. Looks like he's chatting. Andrew, I have it right here too. It's actually in my task list from pre-COVID. No, maybe not. Didn't work. If if need be, we can probably push this to the fifteenth. Yeah. Andrew did get a quote. Yeah, we might have to because my it's it's in my task list, but it's not coming up. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I think this is something that they right put on the back burner for two weeks. <laughs> I was going to call in. <laughs> uh, we can move on to the next thing, Jim, and then when Andrew comes back, he can. Okay. Um, so next is board work. Uh, uh, Roxbury visioning process. I know we did 
just want to make a quick mention of this, but I'll turn it over to Libby. Um, we were talking about, uh, Ryan, Jim, and I were talking that this probably isn't just based on the, the current events, not the best time, but it's something that the board would want, we want to start thinking about just what, what's our vision for, or what's the board's vision and the community's vision and a process for um, how to make that work going forward that's thoughtful and engages the community um, of Roxbury particularly, um, but as our, of our district um, as well as to just what's what's the next steps to make that school something something phenomenal right. yeah and we're going to have a new principal there next year or two so I, we're, we're thinking it would be a good time to you know start that discussion and uh, you know have that kind of be part of, of the new the new leader's thought process um uh schedule retreat and topics um <sighs> I, I, yeah, I think a lot of the ideas we had a couple of weeks ago uh, might not make sense. Um, we might want to kind of do a deep dive into how to deal with some of the, the problems that we're facing and we'll probably have a much better idea, um, you know, in a few months, uh, kind of the, uh, how, you know, what, what this thing that we're now starting on is going to look like in terms of economic impacts, impacts our community, uh, exactly. Um, I guess the only thing I'd really like to get out of here is maybe what sort of time frame, date wise we want. Um, I think I just got a message from Andrew that maybe August or so. Um, is that Andrew? Is that for the retreat or is that? You're, I think you're muted. Sorry, my mouse was stuck on my other screen. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking that this is probably going to, you know, stretch into the summer and then there will be kind of like a little cooling off period and we'll be at the beginning of a, a new fiscal year and there will probably be some realities we'll have to address then before schools come back there will probably be some big issues that we have to consider and i was just thinking like maybe early august might be a good time i don't know i know a lot of people go on vacations in august i, I just wonder if june is too soon considering that schools are going that are canceled through the end of june for now seems like we probably shouldn't schedule plan on scheduling a retreat when that is still the case that that's just my thought though june might be too soon to schedule something in person but it might be a good time for an extended board discussion because if you wait until august you're very close to the start of the school year yeah i'm i mean it, i don't know um I think we'll know more in August, but I also, I, but I don't know how much more. I, I think in June, we might have a good sense of whether, you know, this is the type of thing that's going to extend further through the summer um, and a little more sense of, of, you know, where the back end of this is. Um, I also feel if people are kind of locked down through July, that those few weeks are going to be pretty valuable for um, personal time that people might not want to, you know, they may want to go travel and see some of the people they haven't been able to see and do some of the things they haven't been able to do. So I'm a little hesitant to try to, you know, lock anyone down during that day, but I'm pretty sure in June, uh, no one's going to be going too far. Um, do you want to aim for, late June maybe, and uh, Libby and I can pick a couple of dates and send them around. And I think right now I should probably keep the topics pretty open-ended. That sounds good to me. Yeah. Okay, we will, we will do that. Uh, we also have future board trainings. I mean, we were originally thinking of, you know, communications and equity. Uh, does it, it doesn't make sense to, to do that at all. And, and those topics seem important, but 
something that's getting kind of overwhelmed by current events. I'm also just wondering um, if we're going to be able to get people's time to, to do that, um, both from a presentation perspective and, um, yeah, I think all of us are also in some ways a lot busier with trying to work and homeschool and, um, but I, I don't want to, yeah, I know those trainings are important. So I'd, I'd just love to, to get some thought, or maybe that's something we could, could do in September or maybe even over the summer. Uh, this is Jerry. Do, do you know if anyone's offering anything online? Like a lot of people are switching conferences to webinars or virtual sessions now. Is that um, a possibility? I know that I personally, at my job, since I do PD um, in uh, equity, I am moving my things online for places that are ready to do that. Um, mostly what I've heard, though, is that folks are obviously scrambling to do a lot of other things that have taken higher priority. Um, so, so I do think that a lot of people are available because we're all just really working from home. But... Yeah. Um, but my question personally, as a person doing that work was, would it be valuable to the minds into which I'm trying to put new information if those people are not going to be able to practice it for like several months or if they are frazzled and the information isn't going anywhere? Um, so that's just stuff that I've been thinking about from the delivery end. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering if kind of from an equity perspective, uh, you know, I think we might have some some equity challenges coming into next year that we haven't seen in a while that, you know, in terms of, you know, we might have people coming into grades who effectively haven't had any sort of, you know, productive learning for, you know, a third of the year or a quarter of the year. Um, yeah, you know, and, and and kind of sensitivity and, and dealing with issues around that. Um, should we maybe just table it for a couple more meetings and see how how we're at? I think we're still kind of in crisis management mode. Sure. I think that makes sense. And I also think if we wanted to just do, um, I'm, I'm making this off for myself, if we wanted to do kind of an extended self-contained session, I'm I'm happy to, to lead us through something like that since that's what I do professionally. Yeah, I was just, I actually had that in mind too. And I, we appreciate the offer, but that might be, that might be a great way to do it and just kind of set aside a board meeting um, when we're ready. Um, uh, so we'll give it a, a couple of weeks and then, uh, you know, think about how to, how to do that. Uh, this is the next item is, uh, something Libby and I have had on for a while and it did, it didn't, at the time it did not involve uh, zoom meetings, um, <laughs> but, uh, we were thinking of, uh, finding a way to meld, uh, one of the two monthly meetings and some policy work, maybe, uh, either shortening the meeting and having policy committees meet from say six 30 to seven, and then do like a seven to eight 30 board meeting. Uh, or keeping the uh, the board meeting length the same, but but dedicating like six to six thirty for policy meetings, just so it's a little more self contained, um, and we're not you know people who are on committees are not uh, looking for alternate scheduling times or scheduling locations. Um, I just wanted to throw it out there and see if if folks had any sort of reaction to it. I know that's kind of what the finance committee. Um, yes, and I do mean all committees, um, not just policy. I'm just responding to a copy, comment from Libby. Um, I know the finance committee does kind of a version of that right now where they'll meet from, you know, 5.30 to 6 or 6 to 6.30 before a meeting. Um, but I uh, thought we might want to do it uh, kind of as a regular practice. So, Jim, I have a question. So, which 
I'm just thinking about which committees would lend themselves well to that. I think policy and finance probably would. Um, negotiations probably would not lend itself very well. I mean, it doesn't hurt to touch base. It, it could be helpful, but negotiations, whenever that's happening, you'd still need you know to set aside an hour or two to meet with the other parties. And then if you have a committee like the Foreign Language Committee or the Main Street Middle School Building Committee, those meet at other times too. So what committees, it would, it would, would it be finance, policy? What are, what are the other ones that might meet under that at that time? Uh, uh, we could do like the superintendent evaluation or did you just say that? Um, I think most of them, except for, you know, your like the middle school committee might not, just given the nature of it, that might not have been a great fit. Um, I mean, that and negotiation seem to be the two that are probably most difficult, but I certainly think, you know, finance, uh, policy, superintendent evaluation um, would all lend themselves well to, to that structure. And Libby just said, even negotiations could use a standing meeting. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't think we need to decide right now, but um, well, Bridget just said uh, members on two committees. Uh, and one way we were able to do with that is just make sure that we stagger uh, meetings so it's not an issue because I know that you know not all not all committees need to meet that frequently. Um, but do, do people like that idea? And if they do, do they like the idea of uh, just adding uh, kind of a half hour set slot that people can schedule committee meetings into, um, or? Uh, do they do they want to try to to shorten the second meeting of the month, which I think everybody would love to do, but um, I also know that you know sometimes those two hours go by pretty quickly, and if it was an hour and a half, that might um, that might seem stunted, and yeah, we might end up going till nine frequently. But yeah, and I'm just getting some comments. Um, so far positive, Ryan also pointed out it would make warnings like easier and more predictable. Um, I think it also might make it a little more predictable for the public um, in case they did have interest in attending any of those meetings because um, you know, a scattered schedule is, is a scattered schedule. It is though, Jim, it is hard when meetings go really late at night. So I do think there's a balance there. Those meetings that go to nine are tough. Yep. No, I agree. And some, you know, sometimes when we have things like negotiations or evaluation and executive session and the discussions go on long, we've been quite late. Yeah. <laughs> well, why don't, why don't, I know this has just been introduced, why don't we give it some thought we can maybe revisit it um, at the next meeting and, and see what people think. Um, I mean, my inclination if we do it is to do six to eight thirty, um, so we don't end up going till nine. Um, and um, yeah, you know, maybe kind of be cognizant of um, if we are going to have an active policy meeting to try not to put you know something in an executive session, you know, at the end of a a regular meeting, so we can can strike a little bit of a balance. Jim, do you want to go back to Andrew because he's he's able to talk now? Yes. Um, please go. So we're back to the uh, Roxbury gazebo update. Ooh, is he, is he able to talk? <laughs> I see. Uh, okay, there it is. We have visuals, but but no audio. Unmute yourself, Andrew. 
Not sure that's, does that work? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. All right. So I'm going through my phone somehow through the computer. It un anyway, never mind. Okay. Uh, so I would be happy to kind of dig into the, the cost of the gazebo down the rock a little deeper. So uh, I went and spoke with the folks at Fifth Room, and this is the 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 20 foot cedar. It just doesn't roll off the tongue. The the dead, um, the 12 sided uh, gazebo. Um, they quoted the price. So when we originally looked at it, um, some of the features and considerations of the site didn't really weren't uh, reflected in the original quote. So what we talked about with what I talked about with them was the fact that Roxbury being the Roxbury site being the lowest spot in town and the, the desire to have this be raised up a little bit so that people could they could use it for not necessarily performances but they could put kids out there bands out there whatever and and sort of be elevated a little bit as well like i say that's the lowest spot in town it's very wet so we have to pull it up so some of the features that were included in this quote that weren't in the original was a floor a cedar deck the original quote was just sort of dropping it on a pad uh, but that's not going to work down in Roxbury. We do have to elevate it because, like I said, it's very wet down there, especially in the location that was presented. So that was a bump to the original quote. Um, we also, I also included uh, having a factory stained um, as just easier to have them do it in the factory and um, some accommodations for if we wanted to put power out there. So that is reflected, all that work here is reflected in the quote. Um, so I put together a little summary sheet. So the original, the, the actual structure itself, um, manufactured down in Pennsylvania, shipped up here, we'd actually have an installation crew, their installation crew do it, it's their product. We should have them do it, about $37,000. So what wasn't included in the original price that was presented uh, was a foundation. Um, and what was looked at was doing, what, for what I looked at doing was uh, earth screws, much more popular now than they ever used to do. Instead of the old traditional sonnet tube where you dig a hole and pour concrete, they do now is they take galvanized steel screws and they drill them into the ground. Um, we're going to need, um, so we're going to, that's the structure that's being proposed. But to do that, there's a, we're going to need, we're going to want an engineer to look at that because again, the gazebo folks are going to say, here's our, here's our, here's our gazebo, put it on your slab, put it on your foundation, and they're not going to have anything to do with the engineering. So we'll want to, we're going to need to hire an engineer to kind of just look at the structure, make sure that we have the proper underpinnings for it. Um, we can have somebody do that probably around thirty-five hundred dollars. I don't think that's going to be a, a big cost. Um, as you can imagine, the, it used to be very easy to get engineers and folks to come over and give you the off the top of their head on a project. That's becoming less and less. So they probably will actually want to run some calculations and they're going to stamp some drawings for us. The foundation, again, with those earth screws, uh, I talked with the manufacturer there. There's some local installers, about $2,500 each or $250 each. One of the features that is not included in the, in the uh, gazebo price itself is if we're going to make this, this is going to be a public uh, facility, we need to make it accessible, which means we're going to have to build a ramp to it. Uh, and that's going to be a site-built uh, ramp. Um, again, I'm figuring about $2,500. It seems like a lot of money, but if it's going to be a ramp that's going to be accessible and is going to stand the test of time, it's going to take every bit of that. Site work and site restoration. Uh, we, um, as folks who've been to Roxbury know, it's a very wet site. When you start bringing semis and backhoes and earth screw machines in, you're going to have to go back there and repair the site. We're going to also have to do some site prep work. Um, that's one of the numbers for the engineer that I do think we ought to have a civil engineer come down and look at the site with us and make sure we're siting it properly. And when we reconstruct the site, 
that we push the water in the right direction. But I think you're going to be every bit of four grand of down there putting the site back together. Uh, again, there's accommodation for electrical. Uh, that's not required, but as I look out the window on this nice evening and it's, you know, 7.30 and it's already dark, or, um, you know, I can imagine that someone would want to have a little bit of power out there, whether it's lights or just a receptacle. Um, but to tap into the existing electrical system and bring wires underground, um, probably about five grand. Um, there will be a building permit. Um, public schools are not exempt from building permits. So when it all triggers out, I'm thinking it's probably close to the $56,000 $56, for that structure all in to do it properly. I would imagine that we probably would want to restain it every five years for probably about three grand. This is my thought. Um, Great. Um, thanks, Andrew. Um, I need to be a refresh our list. Just, I mean, I remember that when we left it last time, we were thinking that we'd obviously get this quote um, and then decide whether it made sense and how much the district potentially wanted to, um, to contribute. Uh, Bridget, is also asking uh, whether was there any fundraising at the town meeting? Because um, I believe there was um, the possibility of that. Um, do we know anything about that, Libby or Andrew? Kind of. Uh, Rock might know whether there was there was talk of being of asking the community for some money uh, at town meeting. I don't know whether that ever happened. Yeah. I mean, I'm also, uh, Ryan says, I know that, but he doesn't know it was donated. Um, I don't know. What are folks' thoughts? I, I also, uh, kind of with the money discussion we had a bit ago, um, Yeah, it, it would be a nice structure, but I also think we might be in a position where we might want to feel a little more cautious about expenditures that that aren't necessary. I agree with you, Jim. It is, it's really helpful to have the estimate. I mean, if there really is a community support and support for fundraising, we have a better sense of what it would require so we can share that. But I also think there's so many needs right now and fundraising needs caused by the epidemic, that there may not be as much available for this project. Yeah, that's kind of my sentiment as well. Others? I share that sentiment. Yeah, Jerry just said to agree. Um, Well, uh, that's, that's I mean, my inclination is to table this unless, you know, another source comes up with a fair amount of money and the, the pitch in is, is pretty small, but um, 50,000 or close to it uh, at this time for something that is, is, is more of a, a nice two than a half to seems, um, it doesn't seem right for the moment. <laughs> No, it did not. Jill's asking about kind of the history of the project. This was um, brought to us by a uh, community member and also a pre-K teacher uh, in Roxbury who uh, was trying to raise community support for the project and wanted uh, the district to pitch in, um, you know, a substantial amount to, to kind of finish it. Um, so we wanted to get a sense of what the, the cost was uh, total. And I think at most, um, you know, there's a few thousand dollars in the community. So I, I think unless something has changed, um, you know, to move this forward, the district would, would have to pick up most of the time. 
All right. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for the work on this. We'll, we'll table it and see what we learn from the community. But um, yeah, it, it seems to be something to put on the, the back burner until we're kind of through this and know what our situation is. Jim, uh, were there any plans to share these estimates with the with the um, community, or or was there any um, demand or, or request to share these things? Well, technically, it's being shared with the community right now, right? And we're the community's representatives. So do you have a suggestion for sharing it further? No, I was just curious if since the request came through the community, I was wondering if, you know, if, if uh, what the what the thing thought process was. Since I'm new to this, I was just trying to get the sense of what the thought process was and how much money, um, if the community knew, you know, the, the ballpark estimate and it, they raised $2,000 and they expected $54,000 to come from Rob, from the, from the district. I, I was just trying to get a sense of that. And I think that the, the um, estimate that the, that Dottie, the community member brought to us was significantly lower than that. Um, which is why we had Andrew look into it or, um, because he would have gotten all of the costs. Um, and I don't think that was represented in the first estimate. It was kind of a best guess of dropping the gazebo on a pad. Um, and we recognized early on that, that the spot they're thinking of is a very wet spot. And so we thought that probably wouldn't be the case. Um, so that's, there's a, there's a big gap there. So I can, Dottie's the teacher and I can certainly get in touch with Dottie and, and talk to her about this or Andrew and I can. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I think we should, you know, um, reach out to Dodge and let her know, um, you know, and if, if she can give us new information about fundraising efforts that, you know, might make this a very small price tag. I think that's a different story, but, um, from the numbers I was, I, mean, I think she was, she was thinking that five to $10,000 in the district would do it if I recall. And, um, you know, the, it would be a pretty simple project, but um, this is, I think, higher even than some of the guesstimates you gave, Andrew. Yeah, no, it, it, it's typical. I mean, they, they, they don't, and I'm not, they seem like very nice people. It's just the oh, yeah. product is a, the, they pick it up and drop it on your basketball court. And if they picked it up and we had a basketball court to drop it on, the number that they gave her, uh, you know, several months ago would be absolutely accurate. Um, but it's, we're not, we're not doing that. Yes, no, absolutely. All right. Any other questions for Andrew? Great. The only, the only one process thing I want to mention is, uh, as you, uh, saw, um, we did get one letter of interest for Steve's position. I know there's at least one other community member that wants to give it some thought. Um, so we may have another letter of interest, but we will, uh, we'll take that up at the next meeting and, um, make a choice. I, I'd also, uh, want to make room for, um, for Emma. And, uh, if there are, uh, one or more other letters of interest, uh, for those folks to have uh, a couple minutes of bear time at the beginning of the meeting to, to talk about their letter, but let's plan on doing that the, the 15th and uh, uh, we can get that, that seat filled. And I did get clarity from John Odom that the appointment would be to till town, town meeting day and not the November uh, election. All right, uh, if not anything else, I think we can entertain a motion to adjourn. Wow. <laughs> so, so Bridget, <laughs> uh, Bridget, uh, Bridget made a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? I second it. Uh, second by Aniket. Um, Jerry, yay or nay? Yay. Andrew? Yes, I, uh, yay. Uh, Bridget? Yes. Connecticut? Yeah, Yay or nay?
Yes. Uh, Jill? Yes. Um, Mara? Aye. Ryan? Uh, well, we've got enough votes, so <laughs> I think Ryan's muted. Uh, Ryan, just give a thumbs up if you're... He did, he did. Okay. And it's in the chat. Okay, great. All right, yes. Um, all right, thanks everyone. Uh, we will uh, virtually see you in a couple of weeks. And stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.